important because of my belief and the belief of many other people that I have great respect for uh, that uh, the world is going through a I'll call it a meltdown once the people found out what had been done to them by their representatives uh, they felt that it would be much better for their health and safety to be somewhere else my understanding it was the third ever closed session of Congress we found that no matter uh, where the politician was and what committee he was on when top secret things were talked about uh, they wanted to close the session early so they could get out and put their tips out to the to the news so uh, we don't have any uh, confidentiality in that so it, it leaked out I'm sure. Am I right in assuming that you wouldn't contradict those leaks? I wouldn't contradict them at all. Thank you. This is Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot and this is Monday, June the 29th. And this is a Project Camelot interview with a difference because not only have I flown uh, the best part of 8,000 miles, at least it feels like it if it's not quite that many, from Europe to be here for the weekend, but we are also here with David Wilcock, who's also flown to Los, Los Angeles here for the weekend to join us in a meeting that we had with Dr. Pete Peterson, who's a name that not many people will know but maybe among the many extraordinary whistleblowers and contacts and researchers and scientists who we have had the great pleasure of talking to, maybe one of the most important. And yesterday we were talking off record for the best part of 12 hours and our minds are still digesting an enormous amount of extraordinary information that he shared with us, some of which is off record and as much as possible uh, Pete is willing to put on record here, on camera, because you feel, don't you Pete, that there is profound and important reason why the sort of people who will be watching this video need to hear what it is that you have to say. We want to salute you because you're a very brave man. And one of the things we want to ask you, straight off the cuff, is why is it that you feel that you wanted to put some of your almost unbelievable and very important testimony on camera for a lot of people to listen to and watch and understand at this time? Why is it that you've come forward and you're talking to us now? Well, I think the main reason for that is that uh, I've had a uh, inside insight for many, many years uh, having been picked up in various programs to do things for the government since I was 13 years old. And uh, being a problem solver, I wish I could uh, say that it was hard work and so forth, but I come from a long line of inventors on both sides of my family tree and, and uh, people who graduated from school very early. And uh, were significant in uh, affecting things that uh, affected humanity a number of them in, in virtually uh, every kind of field and uh, uh, climate. And I see that uh, the world seems to have uh, gone downhill. I'm aware of many programs to uh, remove intelligence from people and uh, return the people, at least of this nation, to a, uh, uh, a mediocre status. Uh, we've watched the school systems deteriorate. Uh, we've watched the, as my wife likes to say, the program in the school systems, uh, No Child Left With a Mind. And uh, <laughs> that's her paraphrase for it. And I've seen that uh, the type of government we have, though I'm a patriot and uh, very crudely use the phrase that I got uh, 
the flag tattooed on both cheeks of my fanny the hard way. I spent 10 years in the Marine Corps and uh, a great part of that was in combat and combat zones and other uh, things I did for the government and like to think I am unique in that I was probably shot at on most continents. And uh, anyway, what I see happening is a complete turn away from the way this country started out and then its constitution to what appears to be headed toward a, uh, a socialistic system where reason and logic has no, no bearing and uh, it concerns me and I have no idea if my voice can help. Uh, I have no idea if that can, but I know that my ideas, I have ideas, I have uh, inventions that have proven to be uh, very helpful to society and many of them have been suppressed by the fact that we had a government that was run by industry rather than by the people and it's turned away from that and many industries are actually governed by rules and regulations that make it virtually impossible for them to exist if they do things that are good for humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we've had uh, numerous uh, things that happened in the industry of alternative power that were very inexpensive, uh, very capable, but what we do is we've, through their own legislation, limited the power companies to being able to charge uh, a certain amount over and above their costs. So when their costs went down, their profit went down and they couldn't economically operate. What I would love to ask you about, Pete, before we go into some of the stories that you have to tell, and we have good reason to believe that having spent the best part of 12 hours yesterday talking about a tiny fraction of your experience, I think that we could, we could probably talk literally for days. And what the people watching this video are really concerned about, I think, is what can you help them understand better than they do at the moment about what's really happening on this planet at the moment what are the agendas of the controllers? How much trouble are we in and what can people do? And I want to put that question on hold because this is the purpose of this video as far as we're concerned. And there's a whole separate topic, which is a technological topic, because this man we're talking to now has told us about technology that we didn't know existed and my brain is still reeling over a conversation that we had at breakfast this morning about which I'm going to say nothing. Now, before we start all of that, and that was a wonderful overview that you gave about your intentions, can you give us a little bit of a timeline of your career history, which started when you were very young, um, a little bit about the kind of things you've been involved in? We're not asking you to name names, but we just want to present you as somebody who people can get some kind of an idea of who this person is that we're talking to whose name they haven't heard before. Well, uh, I can do that. I, uh, very interesting thing we were talking about. Uh, I have no idea where these thoughts came to me, but I know that very early on in life, uh, I was so different from the people around me that I thought that probably I fell from the sky in a titanium egg and landed in my grandfather's orchard and my parents found me there. And I think you're probably right, actually, <laughs> having so, talked to you for two days. And until I was about 22, I actually believed that. He is real. He's solid. <laughs> He's but, real, huh? Uh, uh, then I quit believing that when I was in my mid-twenties and in my last few years, uh, I'm nearly 70, and in my last few years I've started believing that again. <laughs> because I find that uh, the people I'm stuck with here on this little spaceship Earth are, uh, uh, don't seem to have the same uh, view. The same view of anything. Mm. And it may be that I'm just wacky. But uh, my wackiness is, uh, has made a lot of products and uh, made a lot of sense to a number of people throughout my life. When, uh, for some reason, I uh, well, probably genetics, because I have on both my, both of my parents' sides, I have long lines of geniuses that extend 
back in history. And I grew up in a home that was entirely uh, powered and heated and cooled in a very temperate climate, uh, was powered by uh, the sun and by atmospheric pressure change. Uh, it was a home that had a, uh, a gallery inside of it, much like uh, Mexican haciendas, but was covered where we grow, grew all of our meat products in the form of chickens and rabbits mm -hmm. and such, and where we grew all of our food products. So you had an interesting and unusual upbringing. Had an interesting and unusual upbringing. And uh, we drove in cars that my father made and invented. And we lived in homes that my father uh, built out of strange materials that were very highly insulated. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad uh, was a pioneer in tilt-up concrete buildings. and and uh, was an engineer for the military when in my youth through Second World War. And, and, go and you were handpicked and chosen for a special program when you were as young as 13. Is this Yes, right? I uh, uh, distinguished myself at age 10 by building a, a number of rockets that held altitude records, world altitude records, and uh, by inventing a uh, material that's used even today to power solid fuel rockets. Uh, that material got out of my hands because I'm not a businessman and wasn't a businessman and freely gave it away and other people capitalized on it. But uh, uh, I liked explosions and so early on started building rockets. There's a wonderful story that you told us yesterday that we'd love to say again very briefly. And I'm going to be using the word briefly in my, in my questions here with, with an apology, because we know that you could talk with us literally for days about the extraordinary experiences you have, the things that you know, the things that you've been told, the things that you strongly believe with good reason. But one of the stories that we want you to tell is what happened one day when you were 10 years old with a bunch of adults, and you had an extraordinary experience. Well, that uh, I'll preface that just a little bit with uh, the fact that as I was growing up, uh, it was in a very small town, small country town, about three blocks long, and, and uh, not a lot of people. My parents uh, had a, uh, a home that uh, had a formal garden and many of the local people would borrow that for weddings and uh, family reunions and things like that, which my parents uh, gladly lent them the facilities. And there was a wedding that went on, and as I remember, it was uh, kind of in uh, maybe June or July of 1950. Uh, and at that point, I had uh, had very limited uh, educational resources in this tiny town, but one of the books that uh, got me very, very interested in uh, ancient peoples and anthropology and archaeology was the book uh, that was written about the discovery of King Tut's tomb. And about the time I finished that book, it got me very, very excited to learn about the Egyptians and learn about the technologies that they had and and who they were and how they built the pyramids, a uh, lecturer came to town, uh, the man who wrote the book Contiki, Thor Heyerdahl, and uh, then that got me excited, so I decided I wanted to be an anthropologist archaeologist and was dead set on it and reading everything I could get through the state library system on that subject. And uh, along came this wedding, and just about as the preacher was to uh, say the words of destruction to the bride and groom, uh, someone pointed up the sky and said, what's that? And everyone turned around, there were about 130 people there, and everyone turned around and looked, and for the next two hours, everyone at the wedding watched a series and groups of what I can only call flying saucers uh, flying through the air, some as close as maybe a hundred feet and some as far away as maybe 20 miles, put on a spectacular show and everyone there saw it as did 
many people in the surrounding community. Were and, they all the same? No, they were, uh, there were very different ones. Some were uh, the shape of a pencil and seemed to have windows uh, along the periphery. Uh, some were round like a ball. Some were saucer shaped with a bubble or a dome on top. Some saucer shaped with two or three bubbles on the bottom. Uh, if you go back and look through the uh, various uh, flying saucer sightings that we've heard about over the years, there was probably one or two of everything we've ever heard about. And uh, these things would dash away, clear out of sight and come back. They would uh, run away from the people at the wedding party directly. So you were looking just at mm -hmm. one spot. And the significance of this is that at this point, you made a major life change, right? At this point, I made a major life change. I decided I was much less interested in King Tut than I was in having my own flying saucer. Right. And so uh, immediately uh, started studying science. Mm. And so I've studied science ever since, and uh, much of it toward the end of building my own flying saucer. And uh, over the years, I came to the conclusion that it was uh, to, to build a flying saucer, uh, you really needed to know first how to build a, what I call a Doctor Who phone booth. And for those who don't know, Doctor Who is a British science fiction, fi science fiction spoof that runs on many stations in America about 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. and there have been something like six or seven different Doctor Whos over the years. It's run so long. And uh, Doctor Who had a red British phone booth. He didn't have a red British phone booth. He had a black police phone box. It was a police phone box. Ah, okay. It wasn't a red one. All right, but he had a, a, a two-holer British phone booth and uh, he would go into it and it would become a time machine. It was called the TARDIS. It was called the TARDIS and uh, so he was a time lord and he would travel back and forth in both space and time. And so uh, as I tried to figure out how to build a flying saucer, I found out it was easier to build a TARDIS. And then I got thinking, well, who wants to just shove a aerodynamic body through air when you can just simply get somewhere and dial your destination and walk out where you are and you don't have to push anything through the air. So uh, uh, anyway, I worked toward that end and have done many, many science projects, uh, some for large corporations, some for uh, We'll call them agencies, mm -hmm. and uh, some many of them for myself. And uh, I'm in the process now, at age 69, of building a uh, laboratory to complete the work that I've done. And having uh, acquired a number of uh, very special pieces of equipment for researching such things. And so that's that's what I'm about right now. And I'm in the process of uh, building that laboratory in a remote location where there are very little uh, man-made magnetic fields. We don't really get television or radio direct much here and uh, have very, very little man-made uh, uh, interference, electromagnetic interference, and it allows me to do my work uh, uh, that I need to do. And so that's that's the life change that happened when I was 10 years old, and uh, so I've been on that pursuit ever since. And we would say, be careful what you wish for, because now you have the understanding, as far as you have, 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 have told us in our conversation so far, you have actually the understanding, if you don't have the factory, to actually be able to make these machines. And you can also confirm that, that the powers that be on planet Earth actually have access to this technology and use it for all kinds of reasons. Is this correct? Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, there are a number of governments that have this technology. Uh, my feeling is, and or my knowledge is, that it's been acquired from people who came to this planet from off-planet. Uh, and it's been from uh, the reading of a lot of ancient documents uh, dating back as far as 6,000 years. To the Sumerians? To the Sumerians. I have a, uh, a Sumerian document that's been translated that tells exactly how to build a, a flying saucer. And it's a direct translation. And uh, it uh, probably doesn't give everything, but it certainly gives the principles. Mm. And I've uh, experimented with a number of those principles and find out that things take place that in modern physics aren't, aren't possible. Mm. And I've worked with a group of scientists that have uh, 
have recently discovered things in both mathematics and science that would lead me to believe that the greater part of science that we have today, and I have a, a PhD degree uh, in natural philosophy, which they used to call physics, uh, that uh, uh, took a lot of effort to acquire and uh, it leads me to believe that these uh, ancient documents uh, portray knowledge that we simply don't have and that the knowledge we do have is wrong. And you've been privileged to spend time in the Vatican Library. Is this something you can talk about on record? Uh, probably, I, well I can talk about things that uh, there is a lot of information there that uh, is very contrary to things that we believe very deeply, both mm -hmm. philosophically and, mm -hmm. and scientifically. Mm -hmm. And that's basically been held uh, away from the public. It's not common knowledge. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of translations, which I think probably came from the remnants of what didn't burn in the Great Library of Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Some very ancient documents, and I was involved at a, for, at a time with uh, machine language translation of a lot of that material, which was uh, in those days was somewhat crude, but at least it gave us some ideas. And the ones that looked good were later translated by people who uh, had done, you know, lifetime studies of the language, and I think they're pretty fair translations. Are you able to say about anything that you learned about the Anunnaki? Or is this off record well, as well? Well, the Anunnaki, who, who are uh, written about in the Christian and Jewish Bible texts. Uh, there are, I, I've seen skeletons of what we call giants. Uh, there have been uh, recent giants. There are, you know, people that would travel around to traveling circuses and so forth that were very, very large uh, through genetic problems that they had, uh, and genetic errors, and all of them had. Uh, joint problems, they had organ problems, they died young, uh, the bodies couldn't support the weight, things like that, but some of the skeletons uh, don't show those uh, anomalies that one would see, and uh, they're very well formed, they're very uh, very much like uh, our skeletons uh, in many respects, and they were written about in the Bible, and they were written about in other ancient texts, so uh, w one has to believe, I know that uh, there were numerous uh, uh, suggestions that DNA tests be run on them once we got DNA testing pretty well down, and I know those have been thwarted by uh, various uh, religions and various uh, uh, school bodies, uh, people not wanting to uh, say that they're uh, there are things that we don't understand, or that they don't understand, or that they don't want to understand. But, but we human beings are from ET lineage, are we not? My, my belief is that, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, radiocarbon dating has, has become very, very accurate. And we have uh, very good records of uh, cavemen that didn't have a language, they drew some, some drew pictures, some didn't. Uh, we found caves with their tools in them, with the evidences of their civilization, with their making crude tools and things. Uh, and there have been a number of spots that those were found, especially in Africa and Europe and the Middle East. And then all of a sudden, over an 80 year period, emerged a civilization that for 3,000 years had the same language and the same religion and the same writing and the same mathematics. And it was very, very advanced from things that came afterwards. And, uh, you know, in modern history, since, uh, oh, let's say 300 BC, we haven't had any civilization that didn't change the language to where you couldn't read it in the 300 year period. Yeah. Now, many of the viewers of this video will be aware of the influence on ancient Sumeria where this, this, this fully developed civilization seemed to appear from nowhere. I was just asking whether you can confirm in any way what a lot of people, a lot of people suspect, which is that we actually are 
have been created or engineered by ETs who knew what they were doing and who, who wanted to create us for special purposes? Well, I, I don't have uh, absolute proof of that. That's one reason I'm building the laboratory here. But one of the things I did notice in uh, the late 70s and early 80s, uh, I did a lot of medical uh, equipment engineering and I designed a machine that uh, would read a field that surrounded the human body and could, uh, could give you a readout on the condition of the organs, the, uh, organ by organ in the body, and uh, then it could locate or find or even create a medication that would fix it. And uh, one of the things that I found was in the early beginning that that machine could pretty accurately come up with 50 uh, diagnosis rate of 50 percent. And uh, of course I wanted it to be perfect and spent a number of years finding out that the reason that I didn't get over 50 percent was because a lot of people had genetic errors in their genetic system and uh, as a result of that they had disease processes that were based on those genetic errors so you had to treat them very differently as people that had a disease that was based on uh, viri or germs or uh, you know other of uh, parasites especially and uh, so I finally got it to where about 70 to 75 percent of the diagnoses appeared correct and the selection of medication treatment appeared so uh, correct and then I thought well okay there's 15 percent here that I really don't understand and it was about uh, oh 10 or 15 years later that we got pretty familiar with and uh, pretty good with genetic testing and I found that that 15 percent of people had very very similar uh, sequences in the DNA that that were unlike uh, the other 85 percent of the people and they were unlike anything else on earth they appeared to be alien to the earth and so I thought, well, that well could be through uh, exposure to some form of solar radiation or some type of ionizing radiation. And uh, so we looked at people that lived in areas that had uh, natural radioactive compounds like the areas in southern Utah where a lot of the, the uh, carnitite and other uranium bearing ores were mined and people at spent time there, people that were in fallout zones of nuclear testing at the nuclear test center in Nevada. Uh, we sent the Gemini capsule up and it went up and well the first capsule that went up and uh, so we're all sitting in mission control and called up and you know ground to Capsule, ground to capsule. Hello, do you read us? <laughs> Comes back, and there was dead silence, and everybody laughed because uh, we had the thing. The last guy that went to work had to be the guy that ran for lunch, and right down the street from JPL, right above the uh, Rose Bowl, was a was like one of the first Jack in the Boxes. And you'd drive in and you'd order and then they'd repeat the order back and then come back you couldn't hear a word. And so everybody realized that these astronauts had taken their turn going and getting lunch and et cetera, et cetera. And everybody laughed and thought they were simulating the jack-in-the-box effect. It turns out that that's the best communication we had. And so immediately Chris Kraft turns to me and says, Peterson, <laughs> solve this problem. So I made a thing that we eventually called the lecture laundry and uh, it was a device that found out why such things took place and they still take place. We still go to drive-ins and you can't understand a darn thing. But I built some uh, no-noise microphones but also had a device that removed all of that problem and we found out there are three narrow passbands where all the information of speech is recorded. Hmm. Two of them record the information. One of them gives you the identification of the speaker. And if you, and, but 
that one passband that gives you the speaker identification has to have a variable frequency start up and drop off. And so you have a little knob on it. So you turn it on in a lecture and you turn this knob until you can hear the speaker very, very clearly and you can hear him perfectly. And you don't hear the airplanes go over, the police cars go by, people shuffling their papers, the noise from the cooling fan, the noise from the rear, the rear projection fan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, anyway, one of the one of the little things out of my life, but I used to build those, and I, when I uh, moved uh, to build my new laboratory nine years ago, uh, I quit building those. So that's one of the products I intend to put back in production. I checked to see why I couldn't get the uh, the final 15 percent of the uh, diagnostic readings correct, and finally came to the conclusion that it was because these people had. Uh, DNA that was uh, uh, had come from off planet, and that led me to think, well, if that's the case, there must be some kind of historical record. And when I went back and looked at the historical record, I found out that there are numerous records and numerous uh, uh, archaeological evidence mm. that uh, we were visited by people from uh, off planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, very probably, in my opinion, not only off planet, but uh, extraterrestrial or extra solar system uh, type of visitors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many different uh, uh, people that claim having seen such things, that they existed, uh, seen such peoples, there are several broad categories of such aliens. Uh, a few, a few, a small percentage of those could be attributed to anything from paranoia to uh, uh, just tall tales or whatever, but when you have as many as there are, all the way down through all of recorded history, leads one to believe that it probably was very, very true that such things existed. And as an example, anyone who wants to find something from the past, uh, read Ezekiel in the Bible. Yeah. In the course of your work, have you encountered any documentation about the existence of our relationship with creatures like this? Uh, I have. Uh, most of them I can't talk about. Sure. But uh, yes, I've seen things written by uh, scientists that I have very high respect for. Some were uh, teachers of mine. Uh, some were people that I worked with scientifically in other fields, and uh, there were casual conversations about such things. Mm -hmm. And uh, led, that's why I have the beliefs that I have that, uh, uh, that we have extraterrestrial DNA in our bodies, and mm -hmm. some of us do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's rather interesting to note uh, that uh, there's been a lot of supposition about uh, various... Uh, various programs to uh, reprogram people's minds, mm -hmm. to uh, throw their thinking off, mm -hmm. to cause them to uh, believe things that aren't necessarily true, but uh, politically would be uh, a very good thing for those in politics and in government and in religion. And uh, uh, it's interesting to note that uh, mind control techniques work on 85% of the people and the 15% that they don't work well on are people that have that particular DNA string. Uh-huh. Okay. So another, uh, you know, just another verification that those people are very different from the average person. Pete, uh, I'm sure we're going to have tons of people wanting to know of this 15% DNA category. <laughs> Is it all one type of person, like one race, or, or, or are they distributed throughout the population? And if you can't tell us, you can't tell us. No, they're, uh, they obviously run in family trees, along family tree lines or family lines, but they're pretty well distributed throughout all different cultures and races. Thank you. I, I thought that was the case. And uh, which would be, which again would be to me a confirmation that they probably did happen because why would someone come and select mm. just one, mm. 
one race or, or one family line. So this is black and white and right. red and Amerindian and Red and, and yellow and, and okay. green and blue and whatever. Yep. How about uh, your DNA? Are you one of those? As far as I know, I am. We probably all are in this room. And uh, <laughs> we probably all are in this room. As yeah. a matter yeah. of fact, I've mm. found that as, as the last uh, 10 or 12 years have progressed, I've noticed that uh, many people, when I talk to about things that I know that are a fact in both uh, science, mathematics, and, mm. and in history, as well as in my belief system, uh, I talk to certain people, and the 85% that I don't seem to have a medical problem with, i.e. the ones that have quote-unquote normal human mm. DNA. I don't seem to understand what you're talking uh, about. <laughs> when I talk to them, it used to be that they would call me crazy, mm. or it used to be that they'd be more really interested and want to learn about it. But uh, nowadays, when you talk to those people, when you're done talking, they don't say, that's crazy, you're crazy, I don't believe it. They come back into consciousness and start talking like you'd never said a word. Yeah, Absolutely. interesting. And so the people watching this video are probably among the 15%. They're self-selective in many areas. Well, really I, I, from what you've told me about yeah. uh, the people that, uh, that you deal with, I would uh, believe that. They're yeah. probably in that 15%. Okay. Now, there's so many places we can go from this conversation, but there's something important which I want to grab here and now. And that is, you made an allusion a few minutes ago to when you moved here, nine years ago to be in a very quiet, secluded place with your laboratory, which you're building, to do your work. And what can you say about why you are here and why people who are elsewhere might one day wish that they were also here? Well, that's something that uh, in our talks of the last day or so we haven't really gotten into, but I'm in an area that had two requirements for me and for some of the people who uh, I do various things for that uh, are not to be named, but uh, one of them is this area is uh, very secluded from man-made electromagnetic radiation. Uh, it's a very, it's a deep valley with high mountains surrounding it in 360 degrees. The entrance to it is through a very narrow, long, winding canyon. So uh, we don't we don't really get radio here or television directly and uh, the, the power that comes in here does have interference on it as well as it has information on it but uh, it's it's very very secluded informationally and then the the place that I chose here is kind of back in a little notch in the mountains and so it's even more secluded so that was one reason the other reason is it's an area that's very highly defendable and uh, that was very important because of my belief and the belief of many other people that I have great respect for uh, that uh, the world is going through a, I'll call it a meltdown. Uh, we're going through a change. Uh, the uh, alternative uh, thought, uh, radio and television shows and motion pictures uh, are all and books uh, and movies are all fraught with the fact that something major is going to happen in 2010 or 2012, uh, the end of the Mayan calendar, uh, earth changes, a number of things. The Yellowstone caldera is very, very uh, active. Uh, the, uh, there are areas up there where the ground has risen. My understanding is it's risen about four feet. Uh, we all know that there's got to be major volcanic activity under Yellowstone area because we can go up there and see the, the mud pots bubbling and old faithful geysering and, and you get the same smell thing. the, smell the uh, sulfur coming out of uh, Hades. And metaphorically the same thing may be happening politically. Exactly. And the same thing happening politically. We've, uh, uh, best, best I can tell, we've been printing not only billions but trillions of dollars with nothing to back them whatsoever. And right now uh, I have uh, very dear friends in China that are offering me mature T-bills and mature U.S. bonds uh, that they can't seem to get cashed and uh, that they're offering to, for 10 cents on the dollar. And uh, they're trillions of dollars worth. It would be enough that uh, if the world court system would uh, 
uh, enforce their eventual payment. Every man, woman, and child in the United States would have to work for four or five generations to pay them off. And what's the connection between that and your being here? Well, that my being here is I'm in an area that because of its geographical location uh, has, it has four seasons, but it has a good growing season. Uh, the area where I am exports both uh, agricultural and uh, meat product uh, in far greater amounts than the people here would consume. Uh, one pry bar uh, or one stick of dynamite would shut uh, access and, and uh, not egress particularly, but it certainly would shut access off so that if there were indeed a failure of the currency and the ensuing uh, political and uh, certainly geopolitical meltdown, uh, this area would be very protected from large groups of people with no money and therefore no food and no energy and mm. whatever. People come looking for food would probably come to an area like this. Is there anything you can say about your belief of the likelihood of these events transpiring? I've been led to believe in numerous briefings and uh, people that I know in fields that very definitely would know and so forth, they've all warned me that I should be at a place like this and many people, even those from Europe and, and other places that had uh, very heavy financial collect, uh, connections in major cities around the world have closed those offices down and uh, a great number of them have expressed a desire to move here if they haven't already moved here. What do you mean, here to this particular area? Here to this you, particular which area. Uh-huh. So, you believe that there's something very important happening this year, and this is why you're talking, one of the reasons why you're talking That's to us. one of the it? reasons why I'm talking. I've kind of, uh, if you would, come out of the closet, because I think that the, the, the people that I find have, uh, are the people now that are say 27 years old and younger have gone through a school system that hasn't schooled them, hasn't trained them and, and obviously because if you know anything about education is very specifically not trained them and not schooled them in political science certainly and in politics and in economics and certainly geoeconomics and they just seem they don't have an idea of what's going on and, you know, we look at a, a uh, president that complained entirely about all the money that the previous president spent and then in the first 90 days spent 10 times as much. Uh, and, and now the, the, it was turned over to the Fed to spend it and the Fed in congressional testimony on television said, we don't have any idea where that money went. We have no idea. We can tell you where two billion of it went, but we certainly can't tell you where seven trillion of it went or six trillion of it went, we don't have any idea. And, uh, you know, the, the people have just let that pass by. Oh, that means that ourself and the next four generations of progeny are going to have to work their whole lives to pay this debt off, and yet we don't even have any idea where it went or who has it. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not out there helping the economy. Mm -hmm. Now, if this occurs, w would this be a worldwide problem? Well, it is a worldwide problem. Okay. I mean, uh, I mean, like the collapse look of the back at James mm. Burke's programs on connections mm. and the thing of it is, is the, uh, it, this is my opinion, but the unions uh, had to do something to uh, get the union members to pay their dues and the only thing they really could do was increase their salaries, so the unions have increased their salaries to a point where the workers had to move offshore because we don't have people that are willing to work and be blue-collar workers anymore. They want to work and get white-collar wages. The white-collar people want to get white-collar wages rather than wages that were consistent with their production. So, in essence, they've stolen from the blue-collar workers and stolen from the, the rest of the world by loaning them money and then taking all their natural resources at very low rates. So this has happened all over the world. It hasn't just happened here. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing economies beginning to fail everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been dealing with a system now for oh, 70 years or better of fiat money, money that's backed with nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's like uh, was said about the Irish when they moved into New York and into Boston. Everybody made money by taking in the neighbor's wash. Mm -hmm. Sure. In your 
personal opinion, and if you can qualify that personal opinion, it would be useful. What do you think may happen if there's some tipping point of social instability or financial instability that occurs before the end of this year? Well, what, let's, what can let, people expect? Let's take a look at the, uh, the depression of, uh, in the late 20s. Uh, people had ethics. They had morality. Ethics and morality were removed from the school systems 25 years ago and for specific reasons. It had nothing to do with reasons of ethics or morality. It had to do with political reasons. So they were taken from the school systems. So in the 20s when we had a depression, people would go out to farmland and knock on the farmer's door and say, ma'am, I got three little kids that need to eat and I'll shovel manure, I'll dig potatoes, I'll hoe the, the, the weeds out of the garden. I'll do whatever I need to do to get something to feed my kids. Now what people have been taught is that they're owed a living. They're owed to live like television says that people should live. And uh, they, they don't have an ethic. They don't have a morality. And so what happens is if we have a financial collapse, it won't be like the 20s. It's going to be like uh, it's going to be like today and you're going to have uh, anarchy uh, and absolute chaos and uh, the government uh, knows that. Uh, they've recently asked uh, the service members if they would fire on civilians if they were asked to, which is entirely against the Constitution. We had a Second Amendment and the founders of our country uh, in writing after the Constitution about where the Second Amendment came from uh, didn't say that we should have uh, the right to keep and bear arms so that we could go get a deer and feed the family. They specifically stated we had the right to keep and bear arms so that if the government with its military got out of hand and tried to suppress the Constitution of the civilians they could take control back because the, the, the government was supposed to lie in the hands of the, of the people. <laughs> Now, not that I believe that the people are smart enough to handle themselves, because they're not. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the last several presidents that we've had. Uh, we'd have actually had senators and congressmen thrown out because they wouldn't, they wouldn't do for mm -hmm. us what was uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. And the senators and congressmen had no option because uh, we had uh, so many splinter groups that they had to keep satisfied that they couldn't do what was necessary yeah. for the people as they were charged to do. Is there anything you can say on record about a recent uh, congressional session that you attended? Uh, yes, uh, probably better not said. Okay, All But right. there, just note that there was uh, the third, my understanding it was the third ever closed session of Congress. Okay, I understand. But and it is on Google, so... You yeah, know, I think uh, th many things have leaked out about it on Google. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we found that no matter uh, where the politician was and what committee he was on, when top secret things were talked about, uh, they wanted to close the session early so they could get out and put their tips out to the, to mm -hmm. the news. So uh, we don't have any uh, confidentiality in that. So it, it leaked out, I'm sure. And... Am I right in assuming that you wouldn't contradict those leaks? I wouldn't contradict them at all. Thank you. But weren't uh, they told to, weren't some of them getting out of the country to relocate in South America? Ask them that. Uh, that's my understanding. Because George Green has given us testimony to that effect. Yeah. I, I, that's mm. my understanding that uh, a number of them to, a number of them felt that uh, once the people found out what had been done to them by their representatives, uh, they felt that it would be much better for their health and safety to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And that kind of says it all. Do you know anything or suspect anything about once the financial system fails, if it does so, what would it be replaced by? Well, uh, up until a few days ago, I would say it would have been replaced by a, uh, a world currency. Uh, remember, the last four presidents have all been members of the Council of Foreign Relations and uh, are, you know, have openly stated that they're moving toward a one-world government. 
and believe we should have a one world government. If we had a one world government, we'd probably have a one world currency. And it might even be they were smart enough to have a currency that was backed by something real, like gold or silver or, or various metals. I've always wanted to see a commodity backed currency. Mm. So you could have a currency that was worth so much corn or so much wheat mm. or or uh, so much, uh, something that was a sure. real tangible thing. That up until a few days ago, you said. Up until a few days ago. What changed? Uh, what changed was, my understanding is now that there, uh, well, the NAFTA and GATT agreements uh, basically put us into a, uh, a system where we had Mexico, United States, and Canada uh, almost as one government with three parts. And there was going to be, a, you know, it's been highly rumored that there was a printed currency available, pictures available on the internet, et cetera, et cetera, because there's nothing that's a secret anymore. Uh, that would uh, have currency of different colors and different sizes for different denominations and was to be called something like the Amero for North America. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been rumored that that currency is being destroyed now and replaced by another uh, U.S. currency that uh, is being printed and that would make a lot of sense because there's so much, uh, uh, well the money that's being printed is funny money because it's backed on nothing but also uh, there's been so much counterfeiting especially out mm -hmm. of Iran mm -hmm. uh, and so you can look at some of our politics with Iran having to do with nuclear proliferation and so much of it having to do with the fact that they have uh, good printing presses and good duplicators of paper and ink mm -hmm. and there's been a tremendous amount of currency that we know has moved here from Iran that is counterfeit okay. and it's rampant. Yeah, many people watching this video will be aware of what David Icke has been talking about um, and we spoke to him at length earlier on this year and one of the drums that he's been beating is about what he feels is the danger of the population being chipped as a means of control, which is going to be linked with their their uh, ability to operate financially at all. Can you comment on that at all? There are a number of things to lead one to believe that they are going to be shipping people around. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of places that uh, there's no explanation for, but very large concentration camps have sprung up. Uh, one of them very near where I live here, that's very large sized. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I was involved back in the 70s with a uh, very large uh, food and feed company to build uh, chips that could be used on prize cattle and uh, breeding cattle, for example, and show cattle to uh, geolocate them uh, or to identify them. And that technology has now been reduced down to things that can be injected through a uh, hypodermic needle and in the body and identify people. And the currency uh, that uh, I'd heard about uh, that was to be a one world currency was based on being chipped. And the, the credits, if you would, would go onto and off of that chip by a method similar to Bluetooth that's used today. And this is technology which you yourself have helped develop, is that what I heard well, you Well, it's technology that developed some of the early things, mm -hmm. and it's technology which, in its smaller implementation, I'm using right now in a product uh, that I'm in the process of uh, building for uh, uh, geolocation and anti-theft because uh, there's so many people being kidnapped and there's uh, and sacrificed for their organs or being kidnapped and held for ransom, not the least of which is around uh, Mogadishu area and in the Mediterranean, but also uh, uh, even in Mexico. A tremendous number of people being kidnapped for ransom there, both mm -hmm. their own people and visitors. And it's a problem tracking containers. Problem tracking sea land containers as well. Mm -hmm. Why is it important to track these containers? Well, there are around 10,000 containers a day coming into the country that are never physically inspected. And uh, we know that uh, weapons of mass destruction 
uh, though this is not totally announced, but we know weapons of mass destruction are coming in in those containers. We know uh, terrorists are coming in in those containers uh, because we see the evidence of it afterward. And thank God the government has, uh, you know, picked up a lot of these things later. But uh, uh, the, the containers, uh, and a lot of them are shipping contraband. A lot of them are shipping you know, we saw the dog food come in that was laced with uh, melamine uh, because it wasn't inspected. Now, we just did a tape change here, and just before that little interlude, David was very keen to ask Pete about his view about um, how can we transform these danger signs into something that is a healthy warning to us, and what sorts of proactive, positive thinking, responsible actions can we take without just blindfolding ourselves and ignoring whatever real risks that might be there. Now this is my bridge because I want David to ask his own question. This is one of the reasons why he's here with us. We have a huge respect for David, his intellect, his perspective, his experience. And David, this is all yours. You want to talk to, to Pete about this very important thing here. Sure. Uh, what I wanted to say was just that I have a perspective which includes documenting my dreams every day for the last 17 years, following their guidance, getting accurate uh, information from that guidance. Uh, yesterday morning, while we were talking about all these things, I had a dream in which there was a volcanic eruption. It looked terrifying. There were rocks flying into the air, and everybody around me thought we were all going to die. We ran under these trees. The rocks fell all around us, but we were all fine. Nobody was actually hurt by it. Obviously, it was a disaster. Obviously, it caused property damage, but the people were okay. And that's one of many different varieties of data that I've gotten to suggest that even though things look like they could be really austere and, and apocalyptic, that humanity will persevere through this and that we will be able to uh, have a positive outcome on our own future and that this is not a situation that's completely outside of our ability to manage. Well, David, you had a question that you asked me just before the break and uh, we, I think there's, I think we're going to agree to agree, but okay. go ahead and ask that question again or, or made that, make that statement again. It was a very good question. It was about prior warnings not having come to pass, oh, and okay, therefore yeah. why should we be concerned? Yeah, let me, let me give you some prelude to that. I spoke with another witness who was involved in various compartmentalized projects, one in particular uh, which was at the Montauk base, and he had extensive contact with people on the inside. And one of the things that he said was that the super domes that were built in all the major cities were intended to be large holding containers for people to be herded in. And he said that there was a plan that the Rodney King riots would foment enough social upheaval that they would be able to actually round up black people who were rioting in the cities and put them inside these domes and basically keep them in there until they passed away. And that was a plan that was made and it obviously did not happen. And so we've heard from many Project Camelot witnesses similar plans, timelines in which the powers that be, whoever they are, say apocalyptic things are going to happen, the dates come, strange things happen, yes, but it doesn't lead to uh, an apocalypse scenario. So in private conversation with us, you had mentioned that there were other dates that came and went where they had said something like this might happen. They told you some friends of yours inside told you something like that, and then it didn't actually turn into a social breakdown. Yes. Okay. I did say that, and so the question is? Well, the question is, in terms of, you had mentioned before that people have uh, a, a conditioning to not think, and a conditioning of mind control, and you said that there is a degradation in the moral fabric of our society. So I think what we really need to know on a personal level is, what, what can we do to help ourselves not be indoctrinated by this passive programming that's coming out to us. And you mentioned aversions of mind control and things like that. I think that's an important key to not getting stuck in this, in this trap. 
I moved here because I was told by various people that I should geolocate and be in an area that would be safe when we uh, eventually got a financial and therefore political collapse. And so there are certain things that I've done to make sure that myself and my family and my friends are safe from that. The question that David just asked is a little bit different, having to do with the fact that uh, numerous ones of us have heard uh, a bit apocalyptic things in the future, ranging from uh, the fact that uh, supposedly in the year uh, 2011 or 2012, the, we have the end of the Mayan calendar and we have an apocalypse coming. Uh, people who are uh, apocalyptic Christians say about the same thing, that the end times are here or coming. Uh, we've heard uh, very, very dire things about the economic posture of the United States and the whole world, and we see things happening. We see things, we see Iceland, for example, declaring uh, bankruptcy. And I hear from people that I know in the banking system that a number of the uh, European states are going to follow them in bankruptcy. And uh, when the uh, uh, the U.S. currency fails, which I can't imagine that it won't because we've printed so much currency and put out there that's backed by nothing. It's all beginning to come home and roost. The T-bills and the bonds are coming back to us and uh, I, you know, I can't see what's going to what, what's happen there. We have the huge collapse that when uh, before the current president took office, uh, 16 million dollars was going to solve all the problem and please get this bill through and we can take 16 million dollars and put it out in and it barely passed and we got that through and then the seemed like three weeks later we didn't know where the 16 billion dollars was even supposed to go or what for because they passed the bill without even knowing what was going to happen that 16 billion dollars disappeared immediately and now all of a sudden we needed seven or nine trillion dollars and then we needed 20 you know, uh, and so we don't have any idea where that went. And so uh, the things we've heard in the past about there going to be a failure, uh, the time came and left and there wasn't a failure, but there was, this money was pumped somewhere. And of course the system had a lot more inertia than we anticipated. So uh, now what we have is something that's that the actuality is coming to roost. I drive around in the, the town that I, I live nearby, the large town, that's about 50 miles south of me, and uh, drive around there and I look in the little malls and I look in the big malls, the big mall has closed. We only had one mall in the town and it's a gross population, nearly, well, 750,000 people. And the one mall that we had, the, the, the people that had the mall failed it went bankrupt and it's closed. Uh, all the stores that sell non-essential items, jewelry stores, bed and bath stores, etc. most of them have closed. Uh, sporting goods stores, most of them have closed. What you're saying is that we haven't been here before. So this we haven't really new. ever been here before. You know, we've heard that things are going to happen, things are going to fail, but uh, you know, life continued on as normal mm. and the government continued to print money and pass it out to its friends. And, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, uh, we're in a bit different set of circumstances. I moved here in 1999 because I was told by 2001 that the system was going to fail. And here we are eight years later, or nine in years later. In fact, you were ordered to come here. I, it, I was. And so we found out that no, it didn't, it didn't fail. But, and I'd go for a briefing and there'd just be a shock. We don't understand it. We don't have any idea why it hasn't failed. I mean, we just don't know. The only thing we can do is say there was so much inertia. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so now it's beginning to fail, and it isn't just beginning to fail. It's increasing on a logarithmic scale. And uh, very shortly, uh, I see that it just about has to do that, which then brings us back to the first question that David asked just before the break was, was you know, what do I see that we could offer the listeners mm -hmm. out there uh, something that they might do. And I can say, well, in my personal opinion and what I've done, I put my money and my t talent, my skills and, and my uh, uh, abilities where my mouth is. I've come here and I'm self-sufficient. I grow my, all my own meat. 
all my own vegetables. Uh, I have stored up those things that are going to be critical to society. I picked up the tools that I didn't have that allow me to do things in, in a, uh, such an environment and such a society to produce things that are going to be necessary for people to have. And you can even make your own radio and probably fuel your own truck. Exactly right. And uh, I have uh, a number of vehicles that I now have uh, engines that will burn alcohol. I have the equipment and I have the seeds and I have the tractor and I have the land and I have the water to grow material that I can make alcohol from at uh, a much larger rate than I need. Now, a lot of people listening to this will say, but I'm in the middle of a big city and I've got a wife and a mortgage and two kids who are at school and I hear what you're saying, but what can I do? I'm not in that situation. What would well, you tell them? Well, I've taught survival for better than 40 years. And my particular area of expertise in survival was urban survival. And uh, I was asked to write a book about urban survival and I started the book out and I can tell you that, and we got into that a little bit earlier, I can tell you that today there isn't any such thing as urban survival. Who knows their neighbors? In, in uh, 29 people knew their neighbors and they had ethic and morality. Now the ethic and morality has been taken away from the children and the children are now in their 20s and 30s. The community is gone. The community is gone. We don't have a community that would uh, mm. uh, do that. And we have people that have children. And now some of them have a couple children. What are you going to do when your kids say, Daddy, I have my tummy hurts. I haven't had anything to eat for two weeks. And you smell the next door neighbor over there who was a wise squirrel and put something up. And you smell him out on his barbecue because he's got no, no power but charcoal mm -hmm. cooking a couple of freeze-dried steaks. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, what would that person do? Okay. But there are a lot of psychological operations that have been put in place in preparation for all of this. And there's a mental self-defense or mental preparation, emotional preparation, spiritual preparation. Is there something that you can speak to? Well, about that, whatever people's circumstances I, are. I, I will do that, but first I want to suggest that uh, take a look at the things that have, just the things that have happened. Forget the political economic situation. Let's take a look at things that have happened in this country over the last, say, four or five years. You've got the debacle that occurred in New Orleans, and then you've got the next debacle that occurred in Texas and, and Mississippi. And you got to see that, no, all those people couldn't leave town because they got out on the freeway and the freeway was jammed and everybody got stopped and they ran out of gas and there wasn't any gas. The people that owned the service stations left to get out of town also, so there wasn't anything for the service stations. Uh, you look at New Orleans, it was, uh, I knew people that were getting water to New Orleans that had been, uh, been ordered a year. Uh, it was a year until it got delivered. There were people who got thousands and thousands of trailer houses that were stuck in the Midwest and never got shipped down there. Nobody got to use them. Mm. But by the time they got where they could have put them down there, the things had already decayed and they found out they were made with the wrong materials and they were outgassing uh, toxic things. Yep. Uh, that was how well the government was prepared for that and they saw it coming and saw it coming and saw it coming. Nothing happened. Then you look at the people that live along the Mississippi River and its uh, feeding tributaries and they've had floods virtually every year and every year they have floods and they go back and rebuild their houses with lots of insurance money and then they have floods the next year. Uh, we have, uh, the weather is changing uh, and I, I think it's changing to the colder rather than the, than the warmer, but uh, you any, anyway, the weather is changing very definitely. Uh, it's changing right here where I live, tremendously so. And uh, the last couple winters, we've had two to three times the snow that we had the previous 10 years. Uh, and uh, then we've had water from it, the major, major water problems. We had droughts for a number of years, and I live near a huge, huge reservoir that holds enough land to irrigate the whole southern state a year or two, and it's been absolutely dry in the bottom, hardly a trickle, and now it's clear full and spilling over. So in summary, you're saying that as a scientist, as an, ex and as an intelligent man, as somebody who's well connected on the inside with other scientists and other intelligent men, you think that there's a real problem? I think that there's a major real problem. And I think that, that people who don't see that and don't realize that uh, simply have, have put blinders on. And I think that what they should do is think, you know, 
Maybe there's something to this, but at least we see that in major areas of the country, there have been problems where people needed to have a little supply of food left because they couldn't get to a store. Mm -hmm. They need to have uh, things that if they have to leave their home, like in the area that I'm in, uh, and in California especially, and in other states especially, there have been major, major uh, fires uh, that have gone on. People have been moved out of their homes, and, and when they left their home, they came back and they're crying on television, oh, everything's gone, everything's gone. And yet some of those people went to survival lectures that I gave, and they had copies of their driver's license, copies of their marriage license, copies of their insurance papers, copies of all the things they needed to have copies of. They had extras of all the children's pictures and extras of the journals and so forth put away in another location. And these are things that people can do to assure continuity even though there may be something come. California, we hear predictions about earthquakes all the time and we see earthquakes all the time. And some are small and some are larger, but we hear the people that actually are predicting those things predicting very large earthquakes. They don't know what's going to be next year or the year after, but they know it's going to come. They know it's going to be large. They know people are going to lose things. Why don't these people have what's called a bug out bag in their car where they can take off and leave the area? The government says, oh, you only need to have three days storage. But we look at where the governments come in uh, time after time after time over the last, just the last four or five years and found out the government didn't have anything for them. Mm -hmm. They had to fend for themselves. And it was months sometimes before they, before they had uh, effort come in. Uh, it's very interesting to, to, to understand when I teach a survival class, one of the things I do is right at the beginning of the class I put a, uh, uh, put a uh, velvet bag over people's head. And then I tell them I'm going to place a $10 gold piece somewhere in the room and have you all look for it. And uh, whoever finds it gets to keep it. And uh, so I do that and then I say, okay, go look for it. And immediately someone says, oh, here it is. I have it. I found it. And everybody takes their bag and says, well, that's no fair. He didn't have a hood on. And I say, okay, so let's say that there's a big earthquake or a big emergency. And if you don't have a way of communicating, because the cell phones are going to be down, the radio stations are going to be down, if you don't have a way of communicating outside of those, it's like having a bag over your head. You're not going to know what roads are blocked. You're not going to know what roads have uh, uh, police that are not allowing people to go through. Uh, you're not going to have gasoline in your car. If you had a, uh, a, a shortwave radio or an amateur radio, which are very inexpensive, uh, you could listen to the radio amateurs who are going to be immediately there because that's what they're set up for, that's what they're trained to do. And if you had an amateur radio license, which anybody can get these days, uh, you, it's like you had eyes. You can see where, where to go, where, the, where there's problems, where there are not problems, where there are riots, where there are not riots and uh, carry on and uh, go there. If you had a bug out bag in your car, you'd have gas and fuel and medical supplies and, and uh, things to keep you warm, uh, things to keep you cool, uh, all packed up, ready to go, just a small bag. So uh, there are a number of things that one could do to uh, become aware. But there's a lot that has been done to dumb down the population. And how can, you, how can this be 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 re reversed how can that be aided I and mean, uh, i want to make sure that david gets a chance to answer his own questions what i'm trying to do is to support you in that and i want to give you airtime here the, there is a compartment of reality that we can talk about in which people are on this planet and there are forces that appear to be almost outside their control to do anything about other than as you said preparations for the sake of survival. Then we also have another context, which is that you are apparently directly aware of extraterrestrials who are not strictly negative. In fact, you mentioned to us before that a lot of them are positive. And we know they're out there, we know they're visiting us. And while I don't believe they're going to just come down and, and save us from problems, there appears to be a greater reality that we are all involved in and that this 
uh, situation, my understanding is that the situations we're going through are going to be instrumental in helping to purge the negative influences on this planet that have been prevailing for so long, not make them worse. There will be a certainly a, a crisis time that we go through, but that's part of a passage into a more organized and enlightened society. That's how it's been explained by many different accurate sources, in my opinion, including ancient prophecies that speak of the coming of a golden age. Well, one of the things that I did in studying survival was I went to numerous places on the face of the earth where there were survival type things taking place, whether it be uh, genocide in Africa, whether it be eruption of volcanoes, whether it be tornadoes and tsunamis. I've gone to those places studying survival and I know one thing. There's one person I can rely on and that's me. And all the rest is conjecture. I found out that uh, the people that survived were the people that were prepared and some were prepared mentally and that's the major preparation that you could do. But I know that when you believe in other people, that may or may not happen, but if you believe in yourself and follow up, it does happen. And you don't have any worry. And I found out that uh, a few days or a few hours or even a few minutes can be the difference between life and death. And uh, so I would just as soon spend a little time and a little effort and a little money and be able to take care of myself and, and my people and uh, if, if other things happen, so much the better, I have things I can share with others. Yeah, I don't, I don't dispute that at all. In fact, I am very well prepared for eventualities in myself. We also at Project Camelot have interviewed enough different witnesses that we are trying to look at the big picture perspective. And I do believe that we have an intelligently guided uh, planet. I, I do believe that, that the things that happen on the planet are not random and I do believe that society itself is going through an evolutionary process and a lot of the things that you shared with us already off the record uh, revealed that there are potentials of the human being much greater than what we currently understand. You've also suggested that there are efforts to suppress our natural ability that have been put in place and I think that while absolutely preparing is important, I think anything you can tell us about how people can strengthen their intuitive faculty so that they have an ability to get in touch with that part of themselves that does have the knowledge. You've mentioned remote viewing before, too. There, if, if they have some way, something you can share with us, a way in which people can greater empower themselves to the greater awareness that they actually possess and how that could help them through these transitional times. I think that would be important to hear. Well, actually, strangely enough, we, we really agree. Uh, and I think we're both saying that one should do both because then you don't have to rely on anything. You don't have to rely on somebody else. And that's the problem. We, that, that what's been taken out of people over the last 20 years is responsibility. People have to take responsibility. And if you look at the over, the, over the millennia, the people that we've considered major, major prophets, such as the prophets of, of uh, Mohammedanism, prophets of Christianity, prophets of uh, 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 records such as Nostradamus, and so forth, uh, every one of those and, and all the religions have said, uh, you know, take responsibility and prepare yourself. And it's uh, the things that David's talking about to prepare are exactly correct. People should have those skills. They should go out and and practice those. And I know that uh, that uh, your group has been uh, superb in providing evidence and providing a website that's a fantastic website where they can go and look and find out people that are talking about such things, people that are saying such things. Uh, I'm basically a warrior because that's, that's kind of my path. And I've noticed that there isn't anybody out there in this world that's taking care of me except me. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's not necessarily true because the knowledge, the intellect, the experience, the vast experience that I have 
has been handed to me on a silver platter. It's like I stuck my hand in the air to volunteer and got a kick up in my rotator cuff and my hand just stayed up and I ended up volunteering for everything. <laughs> and uh, everybody thought I was volunteering and so I got stuck into a number of different things. But none of it, as I look back on it, was by accident. And uh, I know that there are a number of people that were students of mine that were in uh, New Orleans, that were in uh, the Gulf area of Texas, that were in the river areas in uh, Ohio and uh, Nebraska and so forth and, and Tennessee. And I know that all of them, when the time came, just simply threw a bag in the back of their car and headed out and they were fine and all their family records were preserved and all their family jewels and things, everybody knew where they were, they were all in one place, threw them in the car, off they went. The car was full of gas with a little trailer with a couple gas cans and a tent and uh, they were fine. And I'm just suggesting that that is a very wise thing to do in day, a uh, day like today. Whether, whether the prophets of doom are correct or whether they're not correct, let's say you put aside five months worth of food. Well, go take a look at the prices in the store on the prices five months ago and tell me you wouldn't like to buy five months ago's food or today's food at five months ago's prices. You know, it's better, it's better than any investment you could have made. It's better than any stock I know of. It's even better than gold. And if, the, and if a disaster comes, uh, it's going to be worth far more than gold because it'll save your life or, or gold will just get you robbed or silver. And that's why I tell people if you're going to save gold, for crying out loud, save some silver. Because if we have a collapse, when it comes, uh, you know, get yourself a wheelbarrow. And if you come to my place and want a loaf of bread and you've got a, a, an ounce of, of gold that's worth at that time $2,000, I'll swap it for a loaf of bread. <laughs> and if, if you got a quarter, yeah. that by that time is worth three dollars, a, a non-numismatic mm -hmm. silver quarter, I'll swap mm -hmm. it for a loaf of bread. Take yeah. your pick. Right. So uh, there, there are things mm -hmm. that people can do to do that and there are mm -hmm. things that they can do. I would, there are a number of remote viewing courses and many of them are very good. I'd suggest you do remote viewing. Mm -hmm. But I said besides ro remote viewing, I know one thing that's certain. I can take my little ham radio and I can pick it up and I can call on the ham radio repeater and I say what's the what's the traffic like on Route 17 going out through Palmdale? Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to say, oh, all the cars are stopped and they're not letting people through. Or they're going to say, oh, the traffic's flowing just fine, and I know that's the direction to get out of, you know, get out of town. Sure. A lot of people would want us to ask this question. It's almost a matter of duty. And that is, how much does Obama know about all of this, in your opinion? Uh, <laughs> that's... That's a strange question. Uh, I can't imagine anyone accepting the job of president with the current situation. I can't imagine that. So in that respect, I have to say he can't be very intelligent. On the other hand, he's an intelligent man. He certainly is an intelligent speaker. And of course, he was a, a debate uh, king, if you would. Uh, and I know that when he got his first briefing, because I had friends that were present, uh, said that he was so shocked that he had to sit down to f when he found out what really was happening. This was before he took the office. Hmm. Uh, now I think that he's found himself in a, in a river that's flooded and headed south and he's got a little boat with no oars. And, and he very just, steep canyon walls. <laughs> and steep canyon walls, and he's just paddling with his hands as fast as he can paddle mm -hmm. and trying to do the very best job that he can. He he's, has a few really good people around him. And I don't think that he, I really don't believe he has a hint mm -hmm. how to stop what's happening. I don't think he has a hint how to stop the flood because it's behind him mm -hmm. and it's coming on and he's being driven by it and there's not much he can do. Now, speaking about having good people with him, just using that turn of phrase, would you confirm that there are good people who we have 
euphemistically call the White Hats in the government and the intelligence and in the military who themselves are patriots as you are and are trying to do their best from the inside to avert these things. Absolutely. There are, there are many people that left the military. Most of the good people left during Clinton and Bush because they couldn't pledge allegiance to the president because of the things that were being done. Hmm. So many people left. On the other hand, there were many people that stayed behind because they knew they were going to be needed and they sacrificed not principle, but they, they had a higher knowledge and stayed behind so that they could ply the knowledge that they had when the time came. That's where they thought they would be most valuable. That's where they thought they would be most valuable and they were the true patriots because they, they did what was best for the people rather than what was best for themselves. And these are the people who are keeping you informed sometimes, is Some right? of those people are the people who are keeping me informed. I understand. I mean, it's, it's more that they're keeping me informed because uh, they call me for ideas and I'm kind of an idea man and they call me and ask me what, what might we do here and what might we do there? Because you're above all a problem solver and a technological. I'm, I'm basically a problem solver. Do you think there's ever going to be a disclosure that any of this stuff about UFOs or other races not born on Earth would ever get out to the public? Well, I think uh, it's interesting. Uh, I've been told that uh, a number of the uh, apocalypse films that have come out recently and a number of the uh, science fiction things that have come out recently as movies have been partially funded by the government. Mm -hmm. Wanting to, to get familiar in our minds the idea there might be people that could come and help us. There might be some kind of divine providence that would, would help as well. And uh, I, I, I've heard uh, kind of through the grapevine that uh, uh, I, I know that Reagan was asked and uh, asked to disclose such things, the truth about uh, flying saucers and alien people. I know that JFK was asked those things and said he would do something and I know there was pressure to put to bear on both of them to say nothing. Uh, I know that uh, the current president, uh, I don't know this, I have heard that the current president was planning to uh, make such announcements later in the year or late in the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether... Are you willing to say the date when you, you and that information uh, that you no, I know the date I was told and I can tell you the same people that told me that date told me that the U.S. currency would fail in 2001 when they ordered me to move here. Okay. So That's who knows, one. who knows what's going to happen, but I've heard that uh, that his desire, and it, I may be wrong, I don't know. I've heard it through the grapevine. A man hasn't told me himself. Mm -hmm. and I he's under orders, isn't he? He's, the, he's, the, he's just the front my, guy. My feeling is that we haven't had a president since uh, right after George Washington that wasn't under orders from someone else. Mm -hmm. And if you go back and take a look at it, it's pretty obvious. And then if the guy doesn't obey those orders, then he may find himself in trouble. May find himself in trouble. Uh -huh. You want to you want to talk about who who's behind him, at all? I really don't. Okay. Well, about the announcement though, you were working up to an announcement. You were saying that he may announce something, at the end of the year. What would that be? What does your grapevine tell My you? My grapevine tells me that he was going to announce that uh, that there are indeed uh, such things as flying saucers, and there is indeed uh, technology transfer, and there is indeed. Uh, uh, beings behind it that didn't come from this uh, this planet. And how many different kinds? I, I, you know, we're getting into speculation here that... I understand. You know, uh, whether the person that told me would know, I have no idea. Whether the president would know, I have no idea. Whether we even know, I have no idea. Sure. But a number of them, more than, more than uh, say, three or four. Good. And then if you go, well, again, if you go back and look at the, the number of people who seem to have seen such people, uh, you know, you get a, you, you get kind of a, well, there's a reptilian type, and there's a, a long face type, and a round face type, and a tall type, and a short type, and, uh, but you get, it isn't just like one person said this and one person says that, it's 
50 people in the U.S. and 20 people in Germany and 300 people in Brazil and 80 people in mm -hmm. Africa say this. Yeah. And then for the next bunch, there's uh, maybe 40 or 50 in Russia and 25 or 30 in Germany. And, you know, you can't discount mm -hmm. all of those things when from totally disparate regions that have no real communication mm -hmm. and people have no real communication with each other, you hear people doing exact descriptions yeah. and large amounts of exact descriptions. And tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, reporting contact with the little guys with the almond-shaped eyes and the big yeah, heads right. who, who many people say are responsible for abductions. Do you know anything about that at all? Uh, I, I, all I know is that I've talked to a number of those people and uh, many of them seem to me to be very credible. Mm -hmm. Many of them seem to me to have read somebody else's report and then they wanted to be in the thing and made it up. Okay. Are any of these abductions military operations? I wouldn't have any idea. You don't know? Okay. Look, I can't see why the dollar didn't crash in 2001. Absolutely couldn't see why it didn't crash. Uh, because it was backed with nothing. And it was inertia, in my opinion, it was inertia only that carried it on. And, and sure, there were a lot of, there were a lot of people uh, behind the scenes manipulating various things. You saw how they manipulated billions and billions of dollars that didn't even, not only were bogus dollars, i.e. dollars that were printed with nothing behind them, dollars that didn't even exist. Okay. I mean, people, people fail to look at this fact. If, 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 let's say, and we'll use just round figures, let's say that there's a thousand dollars issued. Okay, who issues the dollars? The Fed issues the dollars, totally outside of the Constitution as far as I'm concerned. The dollar, the Fed issues a thousand dollars. Let's say they, they then rent those dollars to the bank. What does the bank do? The bank rents those dollars out to people so they can buy a car, or a home, whatever. And they say, we'll rent this out to you and it'll be at 5% interest. Now what that means is they've taken a thousand and they can, if they have a thousand dollars, the banks are allowed to loan out $17,000. So you have, let's say you have 10% interest on $17,000. So now that's $10,000 plus another $7,000. Where does the $7,000 come from to pay it back? It wasn't ever issued. It didn't ever exist. Yeah. How can they pay back more than there ever was? And people don't understand the, the, the concept of you know, fiat money. Yeah, right. it there will are, be are many videos on the on Google that people can watch on this very subject and get educated. Yeah, absolutely. And the problem is that people have been taught if you just stick your head in the sand and don't look, it isn't going to bite you. And keep on watching American Idol and you'll be all right. And keep on watching American Idol and keep on going to the movies mm -hmm. and keep on, you know, whatever. I'd yeah. like to say one thing. There is footage that you can see of an announcement that Rumsfeld made on September 10th, 2001 about money that was lost in the military budget to the tune of $2.3 trillion the day before September 11th. So is that in any way related to what you're talking about with the year 2001? Uh, probably is, and there are a number of other things. Let's look what happened on September 11th. Uh, <laughs> a, a building that wasn't even involved crashed to the ground and in the basement of it was stored a massive amount of gold. It was never found. <laughs> okay, never found. And why would that building fall down? Not even ashes fell on it. It was out of the wind pattern. Right. Where did that money go and why did that building fall down? Well, do you know the answer? Uh, well, I, I think I know the answer, but I don't know that I'm uh, convenient with uh, giving that answer because, uh, you know, I don't want to prompt somebody to go look for it because I know what, what I feel they'd find. I think what they'd probably find is an early grave. By now, people watching this video will understand why we were so keen to introduce Pete to this audience and will understand what we were saying when we referred to 12 hours of off-record conversation yesterday that we haven't even begun to bottom out even, even so. 
And what we're able to provide here is only a very short summary of some of the things which, which Pete knows. And so with apologies, we're going to move on because we've only got a certain amount of time and a certain amount of tape to other areas because there's an extraordinary amount of, of experience and information which you may want to share. And let me first of all ask you, if you're willing to share any of your experience about working with Russian scientists and in what capacity you did that? Uh, yes, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, some of it at least. Uh, after the fall of the wall, uh, I uh, went to Russia and uh, worked with a number of uh, uh, top scientists there in, that were involved in their space program. And you went to Russia, let me say euphemistically, in a professional capacity? Yeah, in a professional capacity. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I came by invitation uh, and went there. Uh, one of the things we did was we took, and I, I'm going to use Russia in general terms, meaning the old Soviet Union. I went to various, the USSR. various countries that were at one time part of the USSR. And I was there, for example, when the Ukraine declared their independence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew the man who was the first president there. And uh, uh, so uh, we, we took out of the uh, USSR a lot of technology that had been pent up and brought back and uh, donated it to the government here. And uh, I got to see brilliant, brilliant, brilliant technology that we, uh, some we knew about, some we had, and some we didn't have. Uh, specifically in material science uh, and in things that could be used to generate uh, alternative energy, uh, new ways of building motors, new types of materials uh, for building motors and spacecraft, uh, motors and spacecraft, uh, new ways of storing uh, electricity in capacitors which would uh, be very handy in making electric automobiles, mm. meaning that you could take all the energy that normally is sent to the air as heat and braking mm. and put that energy into a mm. capacitor device uh, which would then bleed off into a battery and recharge the battery of the car to a certain extent. Mm. Uh, Did the technology behind the Aurora come from the Russians? No. Uh -huh. That technology was invented specifically right here in the United States by a uh, scientist that I, in my memory, worked for General Dynamics for a period of time uh -huh. and probably worked for Rocketdyne or General Atomic for a period of time. Uh -huh. uh, remember, General Atomic was highly disturbed when Lyndon Johnson refused to give them any more government contracts unless they'd move from San Diego to Texas. Uh -huh. But, but the Aurora has been mothballed anyway, because that's how, that's old well, technology I, anyhow. I, I would assume that. Okay. Uh, but uh, it it was a technology where you spray gas out through a a surface and then explode the gas, mix it with oxygen, and explode it. And it was like it's like push shooting a uh, uh, a pumpkin seed. The pressure external uh, would push against it, and and uh, push it forward at very high rates of speed okay. and very efficient. Okay. So um, <laughs> that was our 60 second sound bite about the Aurora, which is <laughs> worth an interview in itself. But go back to what do you feel that we learned from the Russians? Because we had some fascinating conversations about this. Well, uh, we learned an awful lot about material science. There was a man by the name of uh, I. M. Frenchevik that uh, was a believer in quantum physics, and so he wouldn't hire anybody. This was in the, the late 50s or mid 50s. He wouldn't hire anybody for his institute that didn't uh, that didn't absolutely believe in quantum physics. So a lot of the work they did was based on quantum physics, and we hadn't quite decided whether that was real or not. And whether whether it was real or not, they came up with a lot of things that were very interesting. Uh, additionally, they were doing a lot of research work in uh, such areas as uh, remote viewing and telekinesis and 
such things and we learned a lot. We uh, brought a, a number of people out from there that uh, taught us things and this was a very interesting thing that happened in the Soviet Union. Uh, if you look at their government, it's uh, kind of a three-branch party system that uh, uh, you have the people from industry, the people from government, and the people from the uh, political pedagogy that uh, so that the, the vote, to get the full vote, you had to have someone vote that it wasn't in violation of Stalinist-Leninist political dogma. And a lot of science was definitely outside of Stalinist-Leninist political dogma. And uh, therefore, the scientists were very frustrated, and so there was a lot of uh, information they were willing to give out uh, because their government had told them it was baloney anyway, so why not give it away? They wanted to see their ideas and thoughts uh, utilized. And uh, secondly, there were a lot of them that one way or another snuck out and came to work for the West and brought a lot of uh, very good information, including uh, a lot of the very basic things that were happening in what we'll call uh, psychic phenomena or mental talents, it really isn't that. It's actually, uh, it's actually a definite science and there's uh, a lot of technology that's behind it and we hear a lot of stories about that from the government, a lot of past history that's much of it disinformation. And uh, we're told that, well, we learned a few things from it, but it wasn't, uh, wasn't particularly good. And I think that that's very wrong because I know it was particularly very good. And I can't imagine that they're not using that kind of technology. Uh, additionally, we learned a tremendous amount of things about uh, outer space technology. Uh, we learned a lot about uh, the amount of radiation that you find in, uh, outside the uh, ionosphere and the problems that that causes. Uh, we had some problems with our early astronauts because we, we didn't know what was there. And uh, noticed there were several lulls in our space program as we found out new things and then geared up to uh, take into account the malevolence of outer space. And uh, you know, out of that came a lot of conjecture that there was way too much radiation for us to have uh, had people in outer space and one of the things that very much interested me was when the Mir space station was crashing and they were worried about the fact that it had a little radioactive material on it that might uh, cause problems on earth and they didn't know exactly where it was going to fall. But one of the things the Soviets announced and my, one of the things I do is I listen to shortwave because when you listen to shortwave you hear about the same event, the same people, the same place, the same time and a completely different story of what went on there. <laughs> so the press in the United States is uh, either completely ignorant or it's, it's completely controlled as far as I can tell. But one of the things the Soviets did was announce the weight of the Mir station. And when you look at that weight you find out it was about 5,600 shuttle loads of material and they didn't launch that much, we didn't launch that much. And so why would the weir, mirror weigh as much as it did? And the explanation is, which you can find out for yourself if you merely take a sensitive Geiger counter on a plane flight, is how much radiation is up there just at 30,000 feet. And you're allowed one, one or two chest x-rays a year, you get a chest x-ray every two or three minutes. And out there, uh, you know, that was a problem. If you look at some of the, some of the symptoms of problems some of the early astronauts had, you'd realize that it probably was radiation poisoning. How did the mass that was, that constituted all that extra shielding? In, in, My in feeling that the extra mass that was there on that station was shielding. How did it get up there? That's an interesting question. I didn't see us launch anything that could have taken it there. Did the Russians launch it there? Uh, not that I know of. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen... Uh, okay. Now, what that implies, then, is that we could never have made it to the moon in the way that it had been advertised that we went to the moon because everyone would have been fried. Is, is that too simplistic a conclusion? Well, that's my conclusion. I mean, I know one thing. Mm. You can go to, to look at the moon diorama 
uh, at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and you can ask the question, uh, was the lander pressurized with oxygen? They said, no, we didn't have a place for it. They had to wear their spacesuits. And here's the astronaut standing there with his spacesuit on and here's the door to the lander open and you can see that that spacesuit wouldn't fit through that door without the astronaut in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But so now, I did have a, a bit, you know. There's a, a bit of speculation yeah. there. What we've been told by our witness Henry Deacon is that some of the Apollo missions did actually go to the moon, but not without help from our friends, as it were. C can you make any comment on that, or is this well? It's my feeling as a scientist that if we went to the moon, we had to have help from friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. And all four old friends you're talking about. I'm talking about... Yeah, We're talking about friends in high places. Friends in high places. <laughs> okay. From um, high places. Yeah. But we do have friends in high places, do we? As far as I know. Do we have any enemies? Uh, as far as I know, we do. And is I that... I mean, there have been malevolent, malevolent things happen all over the world that... Uh, you know, you, you can't deny cattle uh, mutilation mm -hmm. and you can't deny some personal or human mutilation right? or certainly uh, biomedical manipulation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's happened. Somebody did it and it could have been done from here. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you examine that, uh, you know, Linda Moulton Howe has written extensively and spoken extensively on these things and examined them extensively. Mm. Uh, I grew up with her in the same school system in the same town and uh, know that she was exceedingly bright and got brighter and brighter as time went by. And uh, I don't doubt that a lot of her conclusions are correct conclusions. She's someone that I would absolutely trust in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it appears to me, you know, I say if something happens in one spot, you don't know. But when something happens time after time, year after year, in all different kinds of locations where people don't know each other mm -hmm. and don't communicate with each other and don't read each other's newspapers and it doesn't make the press, uh, it seems highly likely that those things happened. I understand. Now, among many other things, you are, let me use the, the word, uh, an electronics genius, if I may. And are you in possession of any information about the constitution of implants that have been recovered from abductees? Well, I've talked to people who have removed what, what they felt were implants. Mm -hmm. uh, I deal almost daily with nanoelectronics and microelectronics, and the descriptions and pictures I've seen have nothing to do with any nano and microelectronics that we have in this, uh, you know, from, from anyone that I know of here on this planet. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many of them are, or most of them are biological in nature. I know that one doctor who's removed a number of what they felt were implants, uh, the implant acted like it was alive and uh, uh, moved through the body away from the surgeon trying to remove it. I knew that some of them when they were taken out were uh, minutely dissected uh, and I've seen the pictures of that. And there are devices that uh, signals could be obtained from that were obviously intelligent signals. They were, they were not random things. They were not biological things. And yet it was biological material that had obviously been engineered for a specific purpose. That's really and I don't. I've never seen anything in writing that would lead me to believe that we had that kind of technology on this planet. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about friends or enemies in high places, you'd feel that wasn't a particularly friendly thing to do. I, I have no idea. It could well have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't doubt but what we've had that from both sides, friends mm -hmm. and enemies. Okay. I think there, I think there are people here, mm -hmm. uh, there are people that I felt were, were, had crucial knowledge to the perpetration of the planet the way we'd like it to be. And I've seen them saved from disease miraculously, mm. Uh, mm -hmm. but they had had a, uh, some incident that they seemed to have a memory of 
that we would call maybe an abduction or maybe a, uh, a kidnapping and manipulation. So they're being helped and supported. They're being helped and supported, it appears, from, yep. from somewhere. Yep, yep. Our experience would, um, would support that, all the testimony we've received from a lot of people. It's just interesting to hear your view. This is something we didn't even talk about yesterday. Well, I, I, I try to look at everything from a scientific viewpoint, from an observe, from a, a really uh, unbiased observational point of view. And being as I got involved in quantum physics early, which is something that deals a lot with prob uh, probability, uh, I try to figure the probabilities of things, make observations and feel the probability, well, what would this mean? Mm -hmm. From a probability standpoint, what's the probability that it just happened? spontaneously and the probabilities are approaching zero. Mm -hmm. What's the probability that we had something that would do this? Probabilities are zero or very low. What's the probability that it might have come from some outside intelligent source? The probabilities are up in the you know, 99% region. <laughs> and, and then after you see one after another after another of these, you begin to think, you know, maybe, maybe I'm on the right track here. Yeah, when does it become a reasonable certainty? Yeah, right. Um, we've just mentioned the testimony from uh, our witness and colleague Henry Deacon, and now you talked about your experience working with quantum physics. Uh, you told us about, sorry, let me start this again. Henry told us about his research work in what some people call signal non-locality or action or communication at a distance. Um, one of the holy grails of physics is to build a working device such that there can be instantaneous communication that can traverse light years in no time. Is this something which you're able to talk about at all? Do you have any opinions, experience? Well, or... I, uh, I've done a number of experiments and I definitely have opinions and I can say that Maxwell was right. Uh, one of the things I found out was... This is James, Clark, James, Clark, James, Maxwell. Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell. Uh, who uh, wrote uh, the first exposition of electromagnetic theory. And from a, a little bit of his work, his, I, the way I like to describe his work, it's like you took a white sheet of paper and he took the end of a paintbrush and dipped it in paint and made splotches all over this white sheet of paper. He said, here's something I saw, here's something I believe, here's something I've experimented on, and so forth. So now you have a white sheet of paper with a lot of splotches, which I liken to a window that you could peek through just a few holes in the window, and each time you peek through, you see something different. There's a lot of the area that was still white that he hadn't, hadn't done any experiment in, but there were a lot of various areas where he actually did something and had exper experiments that were repeatable and were eventually describable, if not explainable. So then he took one large bunch of these and he wrote electromagnetic theory around that. And so uh, that electromagnetic theory allowed us to build motors and generators, electric motors, electric generators, uh, radio transmitters, television transmitters, radio and television receivers, uh, computers, the internet, etc., etc., over a period of time. Uh, and so that was passed on down through a line of scientists, engineers, physicists, and so forth, and became those motors and television and so forth. But what happened to all the other splotches? Many of them were never, never uh, continued. Uh, the knowledge was never continued. It was never written about, et cetera, et cetera. So early on, I uh, went and replicated most of the papers, most of the notebooks, most of the letters, that went back and forth, and I started looking at some of these other things. One of the things that, that got out that people did look at was a thing called action at a distance, which meant that something happened in point A, and at point B, which could be clear across the universe, something could, information could be sent from point A to point B faster than the speed of light, and it didn't travel, it literally went through some sub-universe or parallel universe uh, from A to B instantaneously and with no energy required. Just now uh, in Canada, 
and in Belgium and in France and in some areas in the United States, uh, there's a tremendous amount of research being done in that. And uh, so it's something that's it's been known at uh, MIT, for example, for many years. But MIT knows if they talk about it, they got to back up and say all the physics we're teaching isn't exactly correct. So that really hasn't happened, but they want to know that if Harvard says something, that they can say we've known about it for years. And uh, there was a gentleman that I uh, had met several occasions that ran a uh, kind of an anomalous research institute that found that these things that kind of violated the pet, pet laws of physics, uh, they continue to take a look at them, but they knew that if that actually worked and was something that could be repeated, that they better revise their thinking. And for one reason or another, mostly ego, political, or economic, uh, a lot of that stuff wasn't brought out. What can you say about whether there were any practically functioning devices built that, that were able to utilize this theoretical principle of communication or action at a distance? Uh, probably nothing. Okay. I remember that Henry Deacon uh, said that he had actually worked on these devices. He, uh, he said that the work had been done at Livermore prior to Alan Aspect's experiments in Paris uh, in the 80s. Yeah, that's, there, there are, the problem is when you said practical. Okay. Now here's a problem. If you have something that works that doesn't use electromagnetic radiation, uh, you have to develop a whole entirely new technology. Like, how do you tune it? You know, when you tune a radio, what you're doing is altering the uh, the problems with practical. I don't. Uh, we may have a practical technology or not. I know that once I get my lab built, we're going to have a practical technology because I have a lot of uh, uh, work that I've done and ideas that I've done, and I now need to build a prototype. And uh, it's how to tune something that doesn't have a time function. And uh, so uh, how can you transmit more than one signal at a time? And, uh, I, and then uh, I don't necessarily want to uh, expose that information mm -hmm. because uh, not that it's going to be a, a billion dollar product, which it would be. I mean, imagine a cell phone that will work anywhere in the universe with no energy. Mm -hmm. or such little energy that it's inconsequential. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, or internet that works that way. As Hal Putoff once said to me, somebody who I believe you once know, he, he said to me, as the dog said, so many trees and so little time. Exactly <laughs> right, exactly right. So at this point, I'm going to thank you very much for the conversations we've had both yesterday and today. We're still on tape. We've got some time left here today. I'm going to hand over to Kerry with the microphone and the camera. David also wants to ask you some questions about his particular uh, interests, and we want to make sure that we can capture all of this as we possibly can do. So with huge reluctance, I'm going to get out from behind this camera because I'd love to talk to you for hours more. I hope we're going to get this opportunity later. Thank you very much for your interest been involved with trying to build uh, flying saucers, you usually found that flying saucers, if you look at most of the movies, there's always seems to be a robot involved with it. 